Morning. Good morning. How are you? Doing great. Good. How about good. you? Hi, George. How are you? Is my internet okay? Do I seem pretty good? Yeah. 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 Okay. You're fine. Good morning, Director. We can't hear you, Joyce, for some reason. I was unmuted. I was muted, of course. I was speaking this whole time. Good morning, Denise. Good morning, Lillian. We can hear both of you loud and clear, so we're doing well this morning. Allow me one moment just to pull up some of my notes. Uh, Madam Chair, there were a few comments that came in uh, after yesterday's downtown review. So before the, um, uh, remind me when the Apollo comes up that there are a few comments and I'll, okay. I'll jump in. Okay. I think we have a quorum if you whenever you're ready to start. I see Diane, Denise, Charles, myself. That's great. I can I can go ahead and uh, kick us off by reading the preamble. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning for uh, planning commission meeting. I'll go ahead and read the preamble, which will provide some instructions on how to engage during this uh, public meeting. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law and section 101.021 of the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of city planning of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting has the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and un announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. And if you see in the bottom of the slide, there are some instructions on how to find the chat panel. Call-in users can unmute by using star six. 
All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. All requests to speak on a particular matter via our website and email have been considered. We've also received emails from those who have provided written comments on a particular matter. All right, without further ado, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, first, we'll ask Michael to call the roll. Downing. Booker. Curry. Present. McCray Scott. Present. Paul. Slight. Present. Okay. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Michael. Good morning. First one is lot split and consolidation. Uh, permanent parcel number 004-01-138. Um, and this is at 2502 Thurman Avenue. Uh, commission member, uh, did, did you have Grace a question? Scott has raised her hand, yeah. No, my computer keeps doing that. It did that the last meeting. I'm sorry. I'm going to try okay. to see if I can control that. <laughs> Thanks. It wants attention. <laughs> it's okay. Um, all right. It's Michael Horton here from Horton Harper Architects to present this. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, Michael Horton with Horton Harper Architects uh, here to present a project uh, in Tremont that we're working on with uh, the developer of Cleveland Bricks. Um, the project that I'll be discussing today is also in tandem with what I believe to be the next agenda item. Um, it's a cohesive development for um, single family residences as well as townhomes. And so we'll, we're kind of talking about both of them at the same time. However, they're divided by uh, a parcel. So they fall under different zoning review guidelines. Um, so the, the first uh, project here is for two single family residences on Thurman Street and Tremont. And uh, we are requesting uh, approval for a lot split. It's currently a single family parcel um, in a two family district. And this first image just shows you a little bit of the context. Here's the current uh, parcel, 33 feet wide. What we plan to do, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, we'd like to split that parcel into two to put a single family residence in the front as well as a single family residence in the back. Uh, next slide, please. And this gives you an idea of uh, how we plan to organize those two residences. Um, they would have a shared driveway with uh, easement and um, we have a pedestrian path that connects the Thurman Street to the rear residence. Both of these will be three story uh, townhouse style single family homes. Uh, they sit directly adjacent to the left of existing uh, townhomes, and then there will be uh, townhouses to the right as well, which I think have already been through uh, some of the Planning Commission uh, reviews and approvals. Uh, next slide, please. This is um, the additional development that we'll be talking about to your right. You can see the two parcels that divide these two residences. So we're thinking about them together as a cohesive development. And so uh, some of that will be shared with you uh, on the next agenda item. Um, so uh, open to any questions you might have for this lot split for the development to the left of the screen. Um. A question just before we open it up. Uh, have have you submitted the required um, kind of easement to the staff that's required for a flag parcel? Um, we do require that before they'll sign off on this, and that would include not just the easements, but the agreements for snow rem removal, et cetera. Uh, so I don't believe that the developers have done that yet. We certainly understand that it's a requirement and prior to um, flats and surveys legally uh, making these splits, those easements uh, will be in place. We're working with Riverstone Engineering. Uh, they've already executed a survey for this. Uh, we do have a, uh, 
preliminary notices of nonconformance. And we presented this to the block club as well. So everybody is aware, but uh, certainly those will be in place. And uh, we just want to make sure that this development as a whole uh, or the proposed design intent is uh, acceptable uh, for the planning commission. Okay. That will obviously be, uh, who, to my mem commission members, would needs to be a requirement of the motion that before um, the director signs this lot split, that those would be submitted administratively before she would sign it. I have a Here's approval the... with the uh, added items per the chair. Stunning, could you be more specific in the motion um, for our records regarding the easement? I move approval with the um, addition of uh, submitting the driveway plans uh, for administrative review and approval. I will second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Michael, can you call the roll? Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. Ray Scott. Yes. Hi. Yes. In the future, it'd be better to have some of those things in place. Um, I know that you will do them, but. Um, for the most part, flag parcels, as everyone knows, um, can cause issues down the line, which is really the reason for this, which is one property owner, since they own their property, doesn't like the other one, and then the other one can't get in the driveway or no one removes the snow. And so those legal easements and requirements for snow removal and access are very important. And one of the conditions that we would allow a flag parcel so, um, to, to protect the rear property owner who could, you know, down the line, not get along with the front property owner. So that's really the reason for it. The chair will note that for a future uh, lot splits. Thank you. Understood. Okay. So, if you go back, I'll read this 1. I obviously it's the next door. Um, I, I, if you need to go back to this is, um, the adjacent property or. 1 over, which is permanent parcel number 004 17136 135 134. And, um, this is 2492 and 2488 Thurman Avenue. So, if you could present this as well. Sure. Um. <clears throat> We'd have a question. Is this a design review case? If you go back up, or is this a lot split? Or this is a townhouse development. So, is this a zoning matter? I just would like to clarify this 1. Is is this for the townhouse zoning or is this a lot split? This is because the townhouse development exists in a 2 family district. This is for approval um, of a townhouse use in a two family district. Uh, Can I have some clarification from probably staff, either the director or I don't know if Shannon is here? Um, technically, that would be zoning matter of which we would be changing the use to townhouse. Is that correct? I see Shannon is on the line. Are you available to respond? Yeah, this is Shannon Leonard city planning. So, uh, potentially Mr. Moss might be on the line. Um, I haven't seen this specific project, but yes, this would be a zoning matter to place a 2 fam, uh, excuse me, a town home in a 2 family zoning district. It requires, um, city planning commission approval. And if it's a zoning matter, is this a public hearing? Was there notice that was required? So notices for this specific part of the uh, townhouse code at this current time uh, has not uh, been legislated for notice. I know that um, that the updating the townhouse code had come to you guys back in July 2021 uh, and then follow up legislation for that um, is still being sorted out uh, to go to council uh, regarding the 3 requests that was made at the last planning commission. 
Okay, so that legislation never passed that required notice. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay, so we are operating under the old um, townhouse. That is correct. So currently uh, under the 337.031 notice for this section is not required by uh, code. Okay. So um, we will hear this, but to the, to the director, it might be something to follow up on. Um, prior to this administration, we made some very important changes and councilman Slythe recalls to the townhouse code because there were some issues with it around the um, a couple of items that were very problematic and then we approved it and it went to council so i'm not sure what what the holdup is there councilman slice do you have any um, information about that i do i don't, I don't what I, I don't know if it was delivered from the administration to council and uh since i'm not in leadership uh you know i was i was in leadership uh, you know, also at the previous term uh, there is a possibility that it could have been delivered and uh, just held by leadership. So I, I guess I can only speculate on that one. Okay. It was in this instance, it was a, some very good changes that we made that were very important that prevented some, um, some things that were going on, especially with the drives and the, um, you know, other things that were, were problematic, including public notice. Um, so. Um, that would have, it didn't require the exact same public notice, but it required some notice um, to residents, adjacent residents um, as well. So maybe we can check on that and see where it is um, because yes, we were, uh, we were correcting some issues with the new townhouse legislation. Chair, we'll be sure to uh, rally the staff to make sure that there's clarity on this in the future. Okay. Uh, I do see that Shannon has her hand raised, so she may have additional comments. Uh, yes, uh, again, Shannon Leonard um, for to the chairwoman. So that legislation, there were three recommendations made at the July, um, the June or July planning commission that will have to come back before you all uh, to ensure that it's the um, suggestions that you all had presented. Um, and then you all will have to approve it since at the last commission hearing, um, that legislation actually that was presented by Mr. Reese was never actually approved um, according to our records. So those three suggestions will have to come back before you. Uh, and then the legislation has been written and then it'll be sent down to the law department to go to council. So um, that's just the quickest update I can give to you for that. But we will follow up with the director to get that back in front of you guys as soon as possible. Okay. Okay, so go ahead. I'm sorry for that interruption. No, no, it's actually very uh, fitting and timely. We, we've been we've been uh, uh, following closely all of the the, the scrutiny and uh, the, the constructive feedback that everyone has been giving on the townhouse code, and we've been doing our best to try and implement those uh, those those comments and those suggestions, even though they are not um, have been formally approved and ratified. Um, as far as notice is concerned. We've also uh, been proactive about that, and um, these these plans have been sent over to Tremont West Development Corporation's Economic Development Committee, as well as the Block Club, uh, which is the south of Jefferson Block Club. So we have presented this to them already um, and taken any of their feedback into consideration. Um, the, uh, the what you're looking at here, this diagram shows uh, what you're already familiar with based on the last agenda item that we have uh, two projects. The project that we'll be talking about is on the right, the Thurman South townhomes. And um, we, we looked at this, uh, there have been comments from uh, the Planning Commission in the past to try and understand massing. And it's not really a design review um, uh, approval here, but um, wanting to see massing and wanted to see wanting to see strategy and how the townhouse uh, proposal can uh, make a more pedestrian friendly environment um, is what we're showing here today. Um, if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so what we see is um, the proposed development that sits in between uh, our two parcels. And um, that's important because we wanna take into consideration the future development um, and the most appropriate ways to enter and exit these sites and provide as much natural 
um, daylighting for every building on the street, um, as well as um, enhance views and provide view corridors. Next slide. So what we've done, the areas in the green are natural buffers that already occurred that are not on our property. And so we felt it was most appropriate to put the drive aisles opposite that um, to provide every development with the most abundant daylighting and views. Next slide. Here we took a look at the context on both ends. Um, on the west side, we have a series of townhouses that will be fitting right in with the context. And across the street on the lower level, you can see we have some townhouse development, but we also have a number of the you know, late 1800 steelworker cottages. We've noticed there's a consistent um, datum line about 12 feet above the finished floor that we thought, or the ground floor, I should say, that we wanted to follow and articulate to help address a more pedestrian scale development. Next slide. So we created a massing that has the two upper levels that uh, differentiate themselves from the lower levels. So we're considering the first floor at all of these buildings as kind of the podium, uh, for lack of a better term, that addresses the, uh, the street. Thurman is fairly narrow, one-way street with very little sidewalk uh, frontage and no tree lawns. So uh, creating a nice buffer was important uh, for the overall development concept. Next slide. So we're placing these two stories above that first floor podium, and then we're uh, angling the massing so it still has uh, verticality similar to a townhouse development, but angling those walls to create uh, different views from the interior and uh, animate the facade while still staying in contact with what's around it. Next slide. And this is what's currently existing uh, in terms of the parcel. Next slide, please. And this is the proposed split, uh, certainly understanding all of the requirements uh, from the city for uh, snow access easements, uh, et cetera. Next slide. And here is our final site plan. Um, you can see we're creating um, a, a wider entry uh, to a to allow for sight lines for vehicular ingress and egress, it's going to be challenging to see any pedestrians walking around that, that narrow sidewalk. So we're trying to create a buffer between the buildings um, and the drive aisle. So we preserve those sight lines. We're also creating a green space that uh, frames the pathway to the rear uh, two townhomes and uh, organizing that path so it is visible from the street, uh, something that we've been working with uh, design review and planning uh, for years now and making sure all entrances are visible uh, from the street. We also recognize that, you know, uh, the day that trash has to get picked up, we have 10 trash cans that need to go somewhere. Um, we currently have those organized kind of off to the side there to the, to the left of the driveway um, as opposed to having them all uh, up, you know, right up against the corner, um, which will still make it uh, easy to load and unload those cans, but we're considering, you know, where, where to designate something like that. And then also allowing a small green space for uh, everyone that lives on this, uh, in this development uh, to take advantage of. And then uh, in the back, you can see um, at right in front of the two unit townhomes to the left there's a snow pile zone uh, it's not it's, it's not uh, actually labeled but we have a snow pile zone on the left side of the property and then we also have two uh, snow pile zones to the, the top right corner uh, next slide and then this is just a uh, conceptual massing at this point we have it not presented anything in front of uh, design review of course but uh, we want to give you a sense give you an idea of the sense of scale and how this massing can start to, um, you know, enhance uh, the pedestrian experience along Thurman, but still provide um, a dense and well-organized townhouse development. Next slide. Here's a view looking toward the back, uh, the landscaped area, uh, which we will be working with, uh, you know, planning and uh, HDRS on um, how to effectively program that. You can see that the, the upper level massing creates a canopy over the first floor. 
and we're creating landscaping buffers in between with uh, planters and vegetation. Next slide. Another view. Uh, next slide. Another view toward the back. Next slide, please. There's another view. Next slide. And we've also included um, what was the previous agenda item, what those, those two single family houses would look like, similar in their massing and architectural style um, and their urban uh, configuration and engagement with the street and the sidewalk. Next slide. I believe that's the last slide, but um, um, we're open to any questions or comments. Thank you. Welcome. Commission members, any questions or comments? Um, I would say that you did address actually two of the three items that <laughs> are in the change, right? That um, you've addressed the pedestrian walkway with a different, not using the, the drive as the pedestrian walkway and articulating that. And and hopefully, the, I know there's more details to come, that there's a change of material for the pedestrian, especially as it crosses the yes. vehicular access. And then the second thing, which was the one that really, for me, was important, was that the rear units have uh, front doors or doors that face actually the street and not the rear of the buildings, which has happened a lot or along the side. So I think you did both of the ones that I think we had changed in the zoning. Um, I think the only thing left is to figure out um, where in the process, um, director, that um, since all zoning matters are public hearings, um, how we address the fact that this one isn't a public hearing, so there isn't public notice. We don't want, I think the spirit is to make it easy for people to get through the process, so we don't want to make this super cumbersome, but we also want to engage the community in the process at the same time. So one of the spirits of this was to make it easier and 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 more efficient for projects to get through. So we don't want to add more time, but we also want to include residents. So I thank you, Michael, for this and um, I'll ask the commission members for either a motion or any other comments. Move approval, downing. I second McCray Scott. We have a motion and a second. Can you call the roll? Downing. Yes. Hurry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries and thank you. And thank you. You guys do a great job. Actually, I really like the design quite a bit. So see you soon. To the thank chairwoman, you. if I may make up a, a public comment to you regarding process. Um, so uh, the next step for uh, the architect is then to go to HDRS, which he had mentioned, which is a housing design review subcommittee, which is a subcommittee of the staff that review all projects, five units or less. And that, that is mostly a comment for the public for anyone who is, who is listening. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. The next item is a conditional use permit for personal Per permanent parcel number 003-09-079-080 and 81. This is at 5416 Detroit Avenue. And um, I think we'll, Shannon will present first. Good morning, Madam Chair. Shannon Leonard, Chief City Planner, Zoning Section, City Planning Commission. So this, um, this particular project known as Waverly and Oak came before you as a site specific rezoning um, on the larger parcel back in 2021. Um, and so this is just a little bit of an addition to that. They're going to demolish this nondescript structure um, and establish use of 5416 Detroit as a parking lot as an accessory use to the Waverly and Oak development. Um, so on the left hand side of your screen, you can see the larger site specific rezoning. Uh, and then in yellow are the three parcels that will be consolidated by this team uh, to create the parking lot. Um, and because this is new construction um, and it's a new parking lot, um, it, it needs to be approved for conditional uses here in a pedestrian retail overlay. Uh, on the bottom of the hand of the screen, you can see uh, the building that is being proposed to be demolished. Uh, this has been approved by Landmarks Commission. And so we're really here just for the conditional uses in a PRO. Uh, next slide, please. And so for this specific project, they need the conditional use for 
um, off street parking, which is with, within 40 feet of the pedestrian retail overlay along Detroit, as well as a driveway over a public sidewalk. Um, for these two conditional uses, you must determine if the size, shape, or layout of the subject property does not permit the placement of a parking lot um, or driveway uh, in a more suitable location, or it has been demonstrated by the applicant that the placement uh, in a loud location would jeopardize a continued uh, vacancy. And so in this case, you can see that the um, first parking spaces here are at 36 feet and eight and a half inches uh, from the uh, right of way. Uh, and then obviously there's a driveway over the public sidewalk um, as these parcels are landlocked uh, in. Next slide, please. And so again, it's just really off street parking. Uh, within that first 40 feet uh, and a driveway over the public sidewalk. Um, I know there had been some concern before, like, you know, is this, you know, time wasting, um, et cetera, for these conditional uses to come before you all. Um, and it was really, I think the intent was that if these, um, you know, every case is different. And so in certain cases where a driveway could be in a more suitable location, we're really trying to encourage that and get them off our um, pedestrian walkways. Um, and so this is really just, you know, it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward, um, but all new construction and change of uses come before you guys, uh, according to uh, the Department of Building and Housing. So thank you. Oh, and also, I believe uh, Mr. Davenport, the neighborhood planner is here, as well as Mr. Strizzi, who is the representative of this project uh, to uh, answer any questions or present anything they need to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commission members, any questions or comments? I'll move approval, Downing. A second, McCray Scott. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Um, and uh, Michael called the roll. I will say I, I must not have been at Planning Commission when this came, so I didn't see it. It's so dense, but it's really nice. So anyway, I missed it, but good project. Um, okay, Michael, call the roll. Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. A mandatory referrals. Um, this is uh, ordinance number 242-2022. And this is authorizing the director of public works to enter into a contract with the group plan commission to allow them to construct improvements to public square and superior Avenue. And I think the director has a few comments before we talk about this one. Yes, thank you to the chair, uh, to the commission, as well as members of the public. This is uh, related to the mayor's uh, request for legislation to remove the Jersey barriers from public square and then to initiate a design and construction process, which will include retractable, ball retractable bollards. So this is a request to council to release $1.5 million for the design and construction and the study of this area. Uh, the intent is to use that 1.5 million to then go out and find additional dollars. And uh, with this legislation, it would then enable the group plan to go through the design and construction process. Uh, so with that, there is no design yet to present. It's a matter of releasing the funds so that the group plan can go forward. Um, and they would come back in the future for any review. Um, I, I do have one question. Um, I, first of all, of course, you know, everyone's happy and excited about this beginning. Um, I, I think the question is, um, would, would we see this return obviously? And I think the question is, um, since it's kind of a fresh look, which is exciting that this administration and the group plan will take, would it come back in a more conceptual form before final approval so we could see, is it possible, I'm asking, for it to come back when there might be a couple of alternatives to the commission, um, since I think there is some question about a kind of, um, are there alternatives to just a sea of bollards that might be out there. And so I think my question is, is it possible to see this in an interim phase and then a final phase as the design proceeds? Yes. Uh, and I understand and this, if there is yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I understand the concern uh, because this is such an important public space. Uh, I, I would encourage the commission members as you make the motion to uh, ensure that this design does come back in front of the commission and the public for a future review. Um, uh, there, you know, we can follow the, the regular process, whether it's conceptual, schematic, final, um, and we can request that of the group plan. Um, Michael, I see that you're showing some slides. Uh, are you speaking on behalf of this or is someone available to speak on behalf of <coughs> concept? Madam Chair, that would be uh, Jim McKnight. I'm in the okay. Mayor's Office of Capital Projects um, in site development. And we're um, going to be working integrally with the Group Plan Commission and their design team to come up with solutions for this project. And I, I think it's certainly reasonable to come back and present uh, concepts. Thank you very much. That would be wonderful. So maybe we could include that in the motion that it would come back at least in conceptual form and then for final approval. Would make Madam sense. Chair, we have Councilman Slife with his hand raised. Yeah, Ed, th th thanks, Michael. And, and uh, Madam Chair, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll make the motion for approval uh, subject to plans coming back to Planning Commission uh, for our review. Uh, but you know, in making the motion, I, I just uh, two thoughts. Um, one is, I, I guess I'm personally of the opinion that uh, the area around public square is almost over signalized. And I, I sometimes worry that in attempting to preserve pedestrian safety by, but by having so many traffic lights, like kind of traffic lights, give people uh, an authorization to go too fast. And, and I think it's worth studying if there are ways to make public square safer by calming traffic through whether stop signs or uh, you know other other ways that just doesn't have a bus speeding through the middle of the square and, and it's been kind of set up that it allows buses to speed through the middle of the square uh, while there's kids in a splash pad next to it, you know right next to that and it just we, the buses need to go slow that's that's the answer um i also should say you know i, I saw uh, obviously i'm supporting this i'll, I'll be supportive of the legislation um but residents of the city are really unhappy that we're having to spend a million and a half dollars on this. And a big part of that is because the previous administration in putting in these Jersey barriers caused buses to stop in areas that were not engineered to carry that load. Uh, so we put ourselves in this situation. It's really frustrating that we have to expend these dollars. Understood. I, I understood. Um, so I actually, thanks for the motion. Um, which um, councilman is why I'm suggesting that it come back maybe in a conceptual phase so that um, that the administration or the group plan come back with a couple different options that include what you're saying, sort of traffic calming approaches versus just straight bollard solution, like a couple solutions that might look differently at this. Um, because I do agree if you traffic calm, then you can have different approaches to safety. Um, so I think this is to you, Jim, is that to, to encourage the design team that you select or the engineers to take the time in the, in the conceptual phase to look at a couple strategies that might not be the same as the strategies that they were looking at before. Okay, I think that's a good suggestion. Okay, so we have a motion from the councilman. Do we have a second? I'll second Downing. And agree with the traffic comments wholeheartedly. Um, so uh, let's, Michael, can you call the roll? Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. Craig Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. And um, I'd like to thank the administration for actually addressing this issue and taking it on. Um, it's been long overdue. Thank you. Um, mandatory referrals ordinance number 244-2022. This is giving consent to the city of Cleveland director of transportation of the state of Ohio to construct a central interchange improvement. Would like to know also where this is. It says councilman star. So ward five. Oh, this is Rick Slotowski. Good morning to everyone. It is, uh, this. It is in kind of Ward 5, and we'll be making a presentation to the councilman uh, later today. But we'd like to just make one to you to the planning commission at this point and uh, move this legislation forward. The project is the Ohio Department of Transportation will arrange for the preparation of construction plans and specifications 
including engineering reports and for the supervision and administration of the construction. The improvements include reconstruction of 0.73 miles of Interstate 90 between East 9th Street and Prospect Avenue, realignment and reconstruction of several ramps in the central interchange between I-90 and I-77, and reconstruction of portions of East 14th, East 18th, East 22nd, Cedar Avenue and Carnegie Avenue uh, connecting to the interstate. Uh, the city will enter into a maintenance agreement with ODOT to maintain streetscape elements that will be developed within the city public right away. Uh, we have Derek Johnson here today, who is ODOT's uh, designer of record for Michael Baker, that will walk through the uh, presentation and uh, hopefully he's on at this point in time. Derek, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Rick. Thank you, um, committee. Uh, this is Derek Johnson. Uh, as Rick said, I'm the, the deputy project manager from Michael Baker. Um, our design team uh, is working with ODOT on the uh, the CCG 3A project. Um, just to give you a, a, a quick history, a lot of you are, are very familiar with this, but the uh, the central viaduct and, and inner belt uh, I-90 through and around uh, downtown Cleveland was uh, first constructed between 1959 and 1962. Uh, the inner belt study was launched uh, just over 20 years ago uh, in 2000. And the environmental impact statement uh, and record of decision from FHWA were, were completed in, in 2009. Um, following that, the uh, the project was you know of a, a massive scale. You can see on the right there, 90 stretching from uh, 71 and, and 176 all the way through the uh, the interbelt curve to the airport, and then uh, also a leg of 77 approaching downtown. I was split up into, I believe, seven projects, um, and the uh, the first two were the interbelt bridges over the river uh, constructed between 2009 and, and 2016. There have also been pieces completed, um, uh, CCG 6, uh, uh, segments of 77 at the 490 interchange and to the south. Uh, CCG 7 has done some safety improvements on uh, Interstate 71 and State Route 176. And we're currently in design of, of CCG3, uh, which is the central interchange of 77 and 90. Um, next slide, please. Here's a kind of a detailed view on the left of the limits of CCG3, as Rick described. Um, uh, downtown Cleveland is just the, the top of the page there. Uh, you see Carnegie Avenue going east-west and uh, I-90 going east-west, paralleling it and then crossing on the right. Um, the original CCG3 project also included uh, I-77 to the south down to the um, down to the limits of the CCG6 project that was recently completed, approaching the 490 interchange. Uh, next slide, please. The Michael Baker design team was awarded this project in, in 2014 and, and design started, but uh, ODOT put the project on hold uh, because there was not any funding identified for construction. And in 2019, when funding was allocated through TRAC, it was only about half of the original amount um, estimated for the full three projects. So we worked with ODOT to identify what's the, the best use of the available track funds. And we focused on the I-90 corridor, which goes left to right across the page there. Um, this serves as a natural continuation of the work done on the Interbelt bridges uh, west of 9th Street. And it also then serves up the possibility of, of continuing the Interbelt work further down uh, 90 to the east through the trench to the curve or continuing the 77 work to the south. Um, so the uh, the roadways in blue are, are are the permanent roadways we're building. There's some temporary connections that'll need to be made, uh, but this is your CCG 3A uh, project limits. Uh, next slide, please. Just a little context of the the uh, you know stakeholders and the, the areas that are they're adjacent to the project: um, campus district, uh, downtown Cleveland Alliance, and the central business district and, and Midtown. They were, those were all. You know, strong players in the uh, the study and the design of 3A. Uh, next, please. So, briefly, the the CCG 3A schedule. We 
completed the alternatives evaluation report in 2020 and uh, began detailed design. Uh, we're currently um, advancing towards stage two, about 90% plan completion um, at the end of June. Uh, some right away acquisition is already underway. Uh, we identified some priority parcels and uh, the partial and temporary um, acquisitions are, are still, um, still being determined. And the uh, construction sale is uh, scheduled for October 2023. So ODOT's fiscal year, uh, quarter, quarter two of the fiscal year 2024, uh, with construction beginning in the following spring. And uh, CCG3B, the continuation of the 77 work adjacent to this project. Uh, and then CCG4 and 5 are the, the I-90 uh, projects to the east uh, through the trench along the east side of downtown to the Interbelt Curve. Those are, are unfunded at this time, but um, anticipated to follow in the future. Next slide, please. When we engaged uh, uh, stakeholders, we were focused on uh, certain areas that were seen as priorities to the stakeholder groups. The, uh, the 14th Street corridor on the left was one uh, you know, gateway into the city uh, through the project area, uh, right in the middle, 22nd Street. This was the, the highest priority corridor um, that crosses over 90 between, uh, you know, linking uh, campus district and, and downtown and between CSU and, and, and Tri-C and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of focus was put on the 22nd Street corridor. And we're also replacing the Carnegie Avenue bridge. That's the last bridge to the right uh, crossing over 90. Uh, we held uh, five meetings with, you know, approximately 30 stakeholders uh, between uh, September 2020 and, and May of last year. And that culminated with a presentation to uh, the Planning Commission in uh, last May. I was showing the, the findings of some of the aesthetic design and the, the other stakeholder <coughs> priorities that we've been able to incorporate into the project. Um, ODOT has also been actively coordinating with the city, uh, city leadership to, uh, to designate which areas uh, could be uh, enhanced and, and maintained uh, by the city, you know, Capital costs covered by by ODOT through the construction of the project, but then um, future maintenance uh, by the city. Um, I can get into a little more detail of the uh, the aesthetic and and the specific areas uh, that we're we're seeking you know city cooperation uh, for maintenance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just another orientation of um, you know, St. Vincent Medical Center, the Tri C campus, and CSU. Uh, the red outline um, is the uh, the project limits of, of the CCG3 project. Uh, next, please. The 22nd Street corridor was the, the, the primary focus of the, the stakeholder groups in establishing that connectivity across the inner belt um, on the the North side at, at Carnegie Avenue, there were two areas of potential green space identified, uh, making a nice a nice gateway and uh, providing a link then to the south side of I-90 where Cedar uh, comes into 22nd Street as a new intersection. Uh, and there's a, a structure that'll be required to support the Cedar Avenue Midtown connector intersection. Uh, so this gave some Opportunity for you know, providing some some green space, some public possible program space, and we worked with the stakeholders in the city to decide the best use of those. Uh, next, please. Here's zoomed in on the the, the gateway parks on the north side, uh, flanking 22nd Street as it approaches Carnegie. Uh, currently, there's a uh, parking lots on the west side of 22nd, uh, surface parking, and on the right side. Uh, there is a, a business that has been uh, relocated and that site is, is scheduled for demolition by ODOT. Next, please. This is a rendering that uh, Jim McKnight's team from the city provided us. We had uh, shared um, Crosby, Schlesinger and Smallridge uh, working with the Baker team. They have also been working on the 
the previous uh, Interbelt projects, and they came up with some concepts for what these parks could look like. Uh, the city reviewed those and, and provided this in return. So we look forward to you know, we were ex excited by by this, um, you know, representing what level of, of finish and plantings and, and development would be you know, supported by the city for maintenance. Um, so you know, we look forward to working with with Jim's team to to further refine this design. But this is a you know again a, a city rendering of the those park spaces, those gateway parks on the north side of the inner belt, uh, approaching Carnegie Avenue. Next slide, please. This is a view of a CSS rendering um, from down on 90, looking up towards uh, Carnegie and 22nd, the 22nd Street Bridge on the left. There are some large retaining walls that are needed as 90 shifts a bit to the north um, to make up make up some grade. Uh, but there was discussion of plantings or pollinator gardens in this area as it, as it slopes up to the, the park space that'll be at the street grid level where you see the, the larger trees planted along the horizon line. Next slide, please. With the 22nd Street Bridge being a focus and providing connectivity across uh, the interstate, we were able to work with ODOT to provide some additional bridge deck width uh, for sidewalk um, on the east side of the bridge. So the west side of the bridge is still a standard sidewalk width, but the east side was slightly widened, um, and that integrates, that provides a nice connection between the parks on the north and uh, the red dashed shape there is that structure that's required over eastbound 90 to support the Cedar Avenue connection at 22nd. Um, next slide, please. Here's a little more detail of, of what we plan to do on the 22nd Street Bridge. Uh, the, the roadway configuration is, is largely the same, um, but with dedicated bike lanes. Uh, now I think there's a shared lanes across the bridge. Um, so in the image on the left, you can see the, the section view at the top and then bottom the plan. There will be uh, planters and seating spaces on the bridge. There's going to be a 15 foot wide sidewalk there. So almost double the, the standard width across the bridge. Uh, we've been working with uh, Cuyahoga County as a possible partner for the maintenance of those elements across the 22nd Street Bridge. Uh, and they likely would not be permanent uh, integrated into the structure, but rather movable units. Uh, but again, planters and benches are, are anticipated along the 22nd Street Bridge. Uh, next slide, please. Can I ask you a quick question before you, you um... Just yes, go please. Um, if you go back to the section um, or the plan, sorry, is did you look at an option here on the bridge that had the um, the green as a buffer, like as opposed to up against the fencing, so that the pedestrian access? So did you look at reversing those? Yes, we did talk about that, and the the. The consensus of the stakeholder group was more to provide the buffer from the interstate view uh, rather than than the buffer on the street arterial side. Um, you know, it was it was how do we make this feel like it's just a city street connection and you're not actually crossing over this eight lane interstate. Um, so with the way the 22nd Street Bridge, we, we focused on the east side. And then how that connects with the bridge deck required to support the Cedar Road approach, Cedar Avenue, pardon me, approach, um, okay. led led to that opening up. And so the idea was to shield the view of the interstate rather than um, additional buffer from 22nd. But the fact that we were able to get a little more bridge deck with to have the bike lane there does provide a little buffer from cars and buses to the sidewalk. And we yeah. wouldn't have this the street lighting on the curb side, so you'll have curb, the, the street lighting, then walkway, and then right. the planters and benches. But I, I, I have a question. No, I like it. And I mean, I, I think obviously it's an improvement. So my next question is going to be, um, unfortunately, I, I think the answer is probably no, but are any other sidewalk improvements or widening being made along any other stretches other than this new bridge reconstruction? 
the focus was on 22nd Street with with providing additional bridge deck width, and it did take some you know some work with with ODOT to to secure some extra width here. Um, to the south on 22nd Street, we're tying in with the uh, the streetscape work that was done in um, I believe 2015 that that work was completed. So we are trying to integrate with those same you know aesthetic features and widths that were provided existing. So no no additional width, but but definitely following through with the the theme that was there. Um, I don't have any renderings of this, but uh, along Carnegie Avenue, well, actually in the in the rendering that uh, Jim's team had sent us, they did show some you know, plantings in the tree lawn along Carnegie Avenue. Um, but no, we are not, the project is not providing any additional sidewalk widths. There wasn't any um, additional right of way secured for that along Carnegie, Cedar, or, um, or East 22nd Street. Okay. Um, actually, if you could jump back, I, I don't want to get too far off, but if you could jump back, maybe three slides, please. Maybe uh, one more. Or... Oh, so this shows that you know we, we need to work on what plantings are are compatible with the width of the tree lawn and also the overhead utilities that are present that we aren't able to relocate. Um, but we, we do plan on some plantings along uh, Carnegie, uh, and this is just one stretch. The CCG3B project will continue this Carnegie work from 21st all the way to 9th Street. So that you know, gives us an opportunity to, again, with, with a, a willing partner and, and a, you know, a vision that we can get consensus on, we can continue something similar to what we're doing on 22nd and Carnegie all the way over to 9th Street, which provides a nice cohesive corridor. Uh, if you could go one more slide back, please. And one more, I'm sorry. On the on the right side of the screen is the, the Cedar Avenue connection that curves north to Carnegie Avenue, and that is the, the Midtown connector, which if, if people have questions about that, I could discuss that a bit more. But that that's a that's an extension of the exit ramp from from eastbound 90, uh, providing you know or maintaining existing access to to midtown and there is opportunity along cedar avenue for some some streetscape and uh, you know maybe some plantings in that that curve that's opened up inside the city right away where we make the connection with old cedar um, and we're also you know odot will be um, we have areas along the retaining walls that that front um, carnegie avenue for some some aesthetic improvements and some some plantings and um, we also came up with concepts for wall treatments as well and and parapets and and bridge railings. Well, and if I could continue, um, I think jump ahead about five or six slides, please. One more. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. We, as we we worked through lots of different concepts of of what the different uh, aesthetic treatment could be, uh, we came back to the uh, the guardians and some of the patterns in the uh, in the sculpture on the the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. We we had different themes of of water and nature and and bridges and uh, everyone everyone kind of gravitated towards this and you can go to the next slide please you can see how we took some of those shapes and again trying to be thinking about water the lakes the rivers and and also nature and then take this art deco pattern from the guardians of transportation this is a a look at the the wall on the north side of, of i-90 as it uh, comes to the 22nd street bridge and just how we'll We'll work that pattern around. So these these concepts are still uh, advancing in our design, but just wanted to to show you what the uh, what we worked through the stakeholders with. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this comes back to just again the focus on the twenty second Street Bridge, the parks on the north side approaching Carnegie, where we're we're seeking uh, you know a city agreement on maintenance uh, for those. And then uh, the 22nd Street Bridge enhancements and that that bridge deck, the large gray rectangle you see over the eastbound lanes of 90 
uh, on the south there, um, working with uh, Cuyahoga County to have an agreement to, to maintain the planters and, and seating spaces and, and lighting there. Um, and the next slide has a kind of a concept of the what that 22nd Street deck could look like. Maybe go to uh, the next one, please. We did discuss having actual plant, actual a grass surface up there, but uh, there are some maintenance concerns and grading concerns with that. And ultimately, we're going to adopt a similar uh, design to the 22nd Street deck, where we'll have movable planters and and benches, um, and also integrate pavers and, and various surfaces. Uh, to have this be kind of an, an inviting space and again provide some additional buffer from the interstate below to the the cohesiveness of the pedestrian experience crossing over 90 um, and connecting the neighborhoods to downtown so again we're, we're currently working on uh, the stage two plans and 90 percent design um, we've been Working with you know, Rick and, and his team and, and the city to to get an agreement in, in place to maintain those parks on the north side of of, 20, of the interstate at Carnegie and 22nd and working with the county on the, uh, the bridge deck areas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, commission members, any questions, comments? I have a couple. You uh, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, just to, first of all, uh, to uh, Mr. Skotowski, just just so I make sure I'm understanding correctly, all ODOT projects that take place in the city of Cleveland have to get legislation from the city to be to to, to, uh, to to occur. Is that correct? This is this is not because it's the inner belt or downtown. It's just it's an ODOT project, right? Correct. Okay. And um, to um, uh, to the uh, Mr. Johnson. The Midtown connector. So, so you you noted that there would need to be a, a separate agreement beyond the, the strict confines of this ODOT project for the plaza. Is is that true for the entirety of that Midtown connector, the road? It seems like whether or not there's a plaza out over the interstate, a, a place where people could uh, sit and enjoy a cup of coffee on top of a highway. That that just building that road. Uh, requires some degree of decking out over the interstate as well. Would that be a city requirement or a county requirement and then a, a city or county owned bridge or is that incorporated within this project? The uh, the structure will be an ODOT structure uh, and the the only element that we're working with the city and county on is is what is the aesthetic treatment of that surface. If 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 it were just ODOT and there were no no maintenance agreement beyond that, it would just be you know a concrete deck with your standard vandal protection fencing. So we're we're seeking to enhance that, and that's why you know we're working with the the city and uh, and county to to be able to enhance those spaces. Uh, but you're right, the deck is required to support the intersection. And if if you know the history of the the Midtown connector and why that intersection is required there. Uh, Midtown you know, sued the state for change in access uh, from what what the existing condition is versus what the Interbelt full build provides. Uh, so that Midtown connector design came out of that. And also, we can't push south there uh, because of the historic property, the the old county juvenile justice center. So we were really in a pinch there, and the only way to support that roadway connection uh, to provide that access to Midtown was to provide a deck. That extended out over eastbound 90. So we want to take advantage of that space, um, you know, make it something appealing and attractive to walk through or even even pause at. But um, that will require some, you know, ODOT has limits to what they can they can fund. Understand, and and you you touched on one of my points. I, I am I'm, I'm nervous that at some point down the line, at some degree of value engineering. ODOT's going to come back and say the only way to preserve the Midtown connector is to take down the historic structure. Um, so, March 18th, 2022, uh, I don't know if everyone, everyone marked the date. Um, but I guess, I guess just a rhetorical question back for my, my colleagues is um, we all agree we needed two new bridges over the Cuyahoga River. No, no doubt there, but 
do we I, do we need this? We I, I, at some point we need to you know repair the highway. But I, I guess, you know, I took the RTA today. It was five minutes late getting into Tower City. It actually passed the Amtrak, which was three hours late. There's so many transportation projects around the state, and it just seems that ODOT keeps coming forward with overbuilding our interstate system that has traffic for maybe five hours a week. And, and I guess, to me, this, this feels like a waste of taxpayer dollars when there's so much to be done and knowing that the next ask down the road is going to be to, you know, go back to the days of urban renewal and take out buildings so that we can, you know, mitigate dead man's curve uh, when the truth is that, you know, that's, it's just, it's, it's an urban condition. And, and you go to any other city, there's more traffic, there's tight ramps. And, and to my previous point about public square, why do we keep designing everything so everybody can go 80 miles an hour? It's just, it's, it's just frustrating to me. Um, so I'm really apprehensive. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I end up voting no on the final legislation. Um, I guess uh, a, a concession that I'll make is uh, I'm a little uncomfortable as the council representative uh, weighing in right now when the presentation to Councilman Starr is later today. Um, and so kind of with that, I would move to table this for now uh, pending of the deeper conversation with the local council. Madam oh. Chair, I, I would agree with that. I'm really concerned that this hasn't been shared with um, Councilman Starr. So I would support that Councilman's life if you formalize okay. the motion. Okay. I'll, I'll move, move to table. And I'll second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to table. Um, I would sort of uh, just want to more commentary on councilman on your your point. Um, I, I think um, kind of going forward. Um, I would feel differently about this project if the criteria or the spirit of it equally weighed the, you know, ODOT when they're in areas like this, thinking not just about cars, but also about. The point you made about reconnecting our city and using dollars equally for pedestrian um, access as and all other modes as well as as just for um, highway or or cars. So I think it's also a an op as things come in the future for me, if the leaders, the designers, and those who are setting the charge of the projects do it from an opportunity to repair wrongs and to reconnect our city then i think it's a different it's a different story for me and that's just not the charge of this project and the resources that have been allocated to it um so i think sometimes it it matters how the projects are are being led and designed and thought through and and what the values are of what you're trying to accomplish with them but if this is solely a freeway project then i i agree with you which you know it is so anyway we have a motion and a second um and can we have a the roll call michael Tony. yes hurry yes Ray scott yes life yes okay motion carries um we'll see you again after you've uh, met with the councilman and come back to us all right the next uh, item is administrative approvals um so in this case um we just need to go through these uh if you could scroll through them slowly and we'll look at the administrative approvals Uh, were there just two of them? Only two. Yep, only two. Only two. All right, we'll need a motion and, and a second. Move approval, counting. A second, McCray Scott. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Call the roll. Counting. Yes. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. 
Motion carries. Design review cases, um, I'll need to swear in the uh, applicants for these. The first one is the East Design Review. It's a proposed demolition of a multi-story building seeking final approval. This is at 2685 East 79th Street. Um, Brian Smith, uh, if you can, if you're here, if I can swear you in. I am. Okay. I am Okay, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer to the penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. Okay, take it away. Okay, you have the presentation there. If not, I can, I don't know if I can share my screen. There it is, very good. Okay, this is uh, 2685 East 79th Street. This um, building has uh, a rich and storied history uh, with the city of Cleveland. It was actually years ago, it was the Van Dorn Iron Works Company. And the Van Dorn Iron Works Company uh, made all kinds of uh, steel things. So they were the world's largest producer of jail cells, unfortunately, at the time, all the way from Austin, New York, up in Sing Sing to Alcatraz out in uh, San Francisco. Uh, they also produce such great structures around uh, Cleveland, such as the Kirtland water intakes that you see off the 9th Street Pier. When you look out there and you see the big drum, the steel circular thing in the, uh, in the water out there. Uh, there were four of those that were produced. Um, they uh, uh, went out of business some time ago. The building has been used as a CMHA facility uh, for a number of years. Uh, obviously, the building is functionally obsolete. The location of this, if you go to the next slide, you can see that the location, you can go one more, the location is at Opportunity Corridor, which is running east-west there, and East 79th Street. So, this is directly to the east of Orlando Bakery. It is uh, basically on the Grand Avenue uh, site, the frontage previously to Opportunity Corridor was on uh, Grand Avenue. The adjoining areas of this, it's uh, north of Rawlings Avenue, and there's two rail lines that go there. There's the Norfolk Southern Cleveland Main Line uh, to the east, and of course the Nickel Plate, which is uh, north. The entire site uh, net down to about 7.3 acres um, after uh, working with ODOT and providing them the necessary access. It came out to about 7.3 acres. The building to be demolished is the CMHA uh, facilities building. It consists of about 60,000 square feet. Uh, there have been some other demolitions on the site in working with uh, ODOT. Interestingly, after Opportunity Corridor opened, uh, ODOT has still been working on this site because they needed to run a uh, sewer uh, interceptor to get the underpass drained out of the, uh, underneath the uh, roadway. The site has about 165,000 square feet of concrete paving and uh, asphalt paving, about 50,000 square feet of asphalt paving. Uh, the demolition that's being proposed is a uh, complete demolition that would include uh, the slabs uh, and the foundation. The, uh, you, if you scroll on down and you cover some of these next slides. I mean, this is, uh, this is the location. You can see the building there uh, on East 79th Street. Uh, in addition to taking down the building, there's a series of uh, ancillary items, fence posts, sign posts, things like that on the site. This is a major intersection for Opportunity Corridor, uh, anxious to get it uh, cleaned up. I have had uh, initial conversations with Councilman Starr, uh, obviously uh, Burton Belcar, um, we've communicated with them. Uh, Nick Orlando, Orlando Bakeries, uh, right across the street, uh, they are obviously very much in support. Uh, another interesting thing about the site, you just go down and we just keep scrolling on through some of those pictures. I've got some uh, existing conditions of the building. Uh, obviously, it's function. Just keep going. Unless there's questions on these. This is obviously the interior. Um, 
I addressed that adjacent to the two railways. The other item of note is that this is um, right in the transit uh, oriented development area with the red line being uh, to the north and the green line being to the south. Um, just Kim, I'm going. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I think you can go ahead and just focus now on quickly the um, that you'll be removing all the materials and what you'll be doing to the site is just seeding yeah, and grading it or that sort of thing. Yeah, down or grading it. If you go a couple more um, slides, um, all these, all those, yeah, potential future use is why I just want to. Um, the uh, it's property is owned by Opal Industrial Group. Uh, there's uh, the only immediate plan has been resolving everything with ODOT. ODOT still has a temporary easement on the site for landscaping. It is spring of 2022. We've been looking for forward to this for a long time. Um, we're very anxious to work with Belton Bar Belcar, a Councilman Starr, uh, Cleveland Planning Commission, uh, the neighbors. Uh, Orlando Bakery is the real neighbor. Uh, you know, other than the uh, the rail uses that are around there, but potential development, as I mentioned, the transit development is very significant. Uh, the uh, area has been studied extensively in the City of Cleveland's Planning Commission East 79th Street Corridor study, and it's really been identified as a light industrial or food centric district. So to have some type of commercial retail that's consistent with those uses, as envisioned by the city and Burton Car would be in plan. But the immediate use and our request today is for demolition of this building. Thank you. And you will you be removing all the basements, anything, and will you be and driveways, everything, and just will you be seating it? Yes, that yeah, that is correct. The the um, the site has been uh, largely abated. There have been several USP storage tanks removed. Uh, there may be one more once we get into the demolition of the building uh, as a smaller tank. But uh, taking all that down. And uh, cleaning it up is the immediate plan. Okay, and, and specifically, will you be also? You said something about landscaping. Will this site be have some? Please, what will you yes, be doing the, to the site? Yes, the, land, the landscaping. Uh, all the all the areas along Opportunity Corridor are being landscaped by ODOT. Uh, we will be if if we do not have a plan, we don't go right into development. After the uh, demolition, we'll be seeding the site. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commission members. I move approval. We have a motion. We'll um, a second. A second. Thank you, um, Eddie. Any other comment? This is Director Huang. I I just wanted to add. Uh, I we are in support of the full demolition, uh, including complete removal. Uh, this is a really strategic piece of land along the opportunity corridor, which is uh, considered the core job zone. Um, and there will be form based code that has already been developed that will be brought before the commission eventually around how to design the area in a way that is welcoming transit oriented and all of the above. So, uh, Brian, you know, we are looking forward to working with you on that and developing that land use. Thank you. Yeah, as are we. I've been watching very carefully land code and form based zoning. We've had um, meetings uh, with your predecessor and so forth. Looking forward to it. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Can we call the roll, Michael? Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. Trey Scott. Yes. Life. Yes. Uh, thank you, Brian. And uh, we'll see you soon, hopefully. Okay. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Bye. Uh, this next case is East Design Review 2022-009, Carver Park 3. This is the 8 building, 143-unit townhome renovation. Um, this is uh, along Quincy Avenue uh, and East 40th Street. Um, and Christina, are you here from RDL and anyone else? Christina? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Are you um is anyone else from your team or is just you? I need to swear you in. We also have Mark Dodds. 
Okay, and Mark, so both of you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer to the penalty of perjury? Yes. yes. Okay, um, we still have quite a bit on the agenda, so I'm going to ask you to try to move pretty quickly. And we're primarily focusing on kind of the exterior. Uh, yes, so just a quick overview. Uh, we are an eight building renovation. We are in the phase three of the Cover Park Estates. Uh, next slide. Um, just for point of reference, uh, the red outline is the phase three. The yellow outline comprises of the phase one and two. Um, we are bordered by Central East 55th. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a few uh, reference photos. Next slide. Um, just an enlargement of our eight buildings. We have six grouped together. Uh, they face each other. And I know this is going to probably be a point of conversation, but there is a promenade uh, between them. Um, and we will be talking about some stuff we're going to be doing in that area. And then we have two buildings off by themselves up at the north part of the development. Next slide. Here are some just photos of what the existing buildings are. Uh, they are from the 40s. Um, they all kind of have this very similar, similar look with the brick. At some point, some sort of stucco material has been added to them. Um, next slide. Uh, just some more kind of uh, reference photos. Next slide, please. Um, just one Mark, second. One thing, that's in, one thing that's important to understand about these buildings is that they're stacked townhomes. Okay, so the first and second floor, which are accessed from sort of the back of the building, is is the lower level townhomes, and then off of the promenade, the ends of the building, you walk upstairs to the second floor, go into a landing, and then there's a stair that takes you up to the third floor which is the first level of the two-story townhouse on the top. Um, yeah, the, actually the interiors are very challenging on these buildings, just the way that they were uh, constructed. Um, but I will we'll try to focus on more kind of the exterior uh, for time. Um, Below are photos from the uh, phase one and phase two of Carver Park. Um, we try, I mean, yeah, clearly we're working with a different style of building, but we do want our intervention on the exterior to kind of work with the material palette that is down there. Um, and I think, you know, the existing, the phase one and two was cladded with a hardy board material. So we want to pick up the same kind of color palette uh, for our part. Next phase, next slide, please. Um, next slide. So here, I just want to talk through some of the uh, the site improvements uh, that we're looking at doing. Um, you know kind of restoring and trimming back around the monument sign. Um, since we have presented this to the East Design View, we're also talking about staining that concrete just to give a little pop of color. Um, there, we were repairing the fence that goes around the property. Uh, there are also interior fences that we will just be removing. Um, we are repairing the playground equipment and replacing the safety surface below it. Um, we're trimming back uh, the trees away from the buildings. Um, part of that is to improve sight lines, improve. Uh, we're actually going to extend the camera system for phase one and two. So that will actually 
allow the cameras to kind of catch more um, of what they need to catch and not have tree branches in the way. Um, we are repairing or replacing the existing sidewalks as needed uh, to provide a, you know accessible route. Then we're just doing maintenance things like jetting the sewers, cameraing the sewers, making sure the infrastructure is functioning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we, when we presented to the East Design Review is that we've done residents meetings, getting feedback of what the residents, how they uh, think or how they feel about the existing buildings. And the thing that they keep on bringing up every time is safety. Is, you know, they've had some issues down there. Uh, so part of our intervention is, 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 is improving the safety, things that we can do with the existing buildings, with the existing site work. Um, so there, are trees that line the promenade between the buildings. The trees are not the appropriate trees for this uh, configuration. They're big, they're overgrown. Um, they actually block a lot of the sun. So it's kind of even on a sunny day, it's very shady in there. You know, you lose that visibility. And also just talking about, you know, as we add cameras, and we add more exterior building lights to improve the safety is that those trees really get in the way. Um, so what we had initially proposed is to completely remove the trees. We got some push. And again, I like trees. It's just balancing the safety aspect of, of all the different uh, requirements. So we initially proposed removing the trees that sparked some really good additional conversation um, with the Midtown uh, city manager and she's connecting us with, and I'm probably going to totally be. It's uh, Western Reserve Land Conservancy. Yes. We Talk have a meeting with them next week. Yes. Talking about ways that we could potentially maybe do more pruning of the trees instead of doing a complete removal of the trees. Um, and just because I know there's been some feedback about just in the central neighborhood that they're losing their tree canopy. Um, so we are very open to working with the various groups to preserve or where needed if we have to cut a tree down to place trees there that will enhance what they have. And we just think we're going to have to look at a different species. These are very dense trees. We need lacy trees that um, that are more transparent. But we'll be uh, back I, to present that. Um, it, or if you could move through a little quickly, we're going to have a quorum issue in an hour, so okay, I need you right. guys to move through a lot quickly. Okay. Then, please. Uh, next slide. Um, I mean, I'm going. To, this is the last four buildings. You know, we're just touching on the kind of the same um, thoughts, preparing monument signs, playground equipment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is actually what we're proposing for the promenade, uh, new stair and entry canopies. Again, looking at painting the ephus, giving them a pop of color, working within the existing color context. Uh, this is a shot of the promenade, you know, again, without the trees. Um, and we're also looking at things, you know, new windows, repairing the brick. Next slide. Uh, this is just a uh, view from uh, the buildings up at East 55th. Next slide. Um, we're looking at our color palette, um, kind of material palette as well. Looking at the, the new light fixtures that we're proposing. 
Next slide. Uh, we're going to theme the buildings a different color. So this is just our color scheme for the site plan. Next slide. Um, and this is just looking at the exterior elevations where we're going to be adding color. Uh, these renderings or these elevations are outdated based on some of the feedback we've received. Um, so our next presentation, we will be sh showing, seeing more color, and we're actually also introducing a secondary color just to kind of break it up a little bit. Next slide. Same thing in green. Next slide in red. And the remainder of our slides is just the requirements for showing elevations and- but We don't need to see that. You don't need to see that. So basically, no. we have come to the end of the bulk of the presentation. Okay. Um, and, I, and so I'm gonna ask the commission members, um, for whatever we do today, we should hold off on the issue of the trees on the, until that is resolved. But uh, commission members? I'm sure councilman you have some your motion should include something about the trees. <laughs> um, I will uh, I will I will move approval uh, incorporating the comments from design review and and also with the not today I think that we're going to circle back on that. Madam chair we did have Nicole Calhoun with her hand raised. Um first we have a motion can I have a second? I'll second Downing. Um, okay, Nicole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the main um, things that we were talking about with the East Design Review Committee is the prison-like uh, aesthetics and taking down the trees instead of maintaining the trees was another issue. Also, the lighting choices. So I'd like to just reiterate for um, the sake of you all, because you weren't at the meeting, that these were major concerns that the uh, lighting that is proposed was prison-like, is the quote that was used, and that it, the promenade should be uh, lit as a promenade. So um, they were saying that it's not enough lighting and they were asking that um, the, even the trees under the trees, there should be or uh, could be lighting that could light under the trees as a real promenade. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. So my question is to the the this was schematic approval. We are approving this with the design review comments, Nicole. So they will have to address those issues when they come back. But thank you for pointing them out. So um, the councilman's motion was that when they come back for final approval, that they have addressed all the local concerns and they have resolved the tree the issues of removing the trees or keeping the trees. So. Um, just make that clear to the applicants that those are major concerns and they need to be addressed before you come back. So with and that, we are addressing the, them. We're, we're okay. in approval. We are addressing them. So yeah. Well, we'll see you again, and I, I think local will see you again uh, then as well. So um, uh, call the roll, Michael. Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. Trey Scott. Yes. Life. Yes. Okay, thank you all. We'll see you soon. Thank you and good luck. Um, the next case, um, so uh, I'm gonna ask the question of staff. I think the next one is the flats design guidelines. I don't wanna lose a quorum, so I wanna ask this to staff. I don't know how long this is gonna take, but if this is gonna take a while, I would prefer to go to the cases that require approval first. So to the director, how do you feel about moving this to the end, or is it essential prior to hearing the remaining cases? Working with the applicant, and they can do this presentation in ten minutes. Um, is that adequate? I, I don't believe the the remaining agenda items will take more than twenty minutes. Okay, my yeah. preference is I what I'd hate to have is we're going to lose Diane. Yeah. As, is that the cases that need permits don't get approved sure. today. So 
does this does this flats design guidelines relate to 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 the cases or is it just in a, a special presentation it's it's an overall framework for how we want to address design along the riverfront um but we can go ahead and move towards the cases first yeah i think so we Joel, should if you could yeah Joel, okay. if you could hold thanks yeah. we'll just do it after the there are only three cases left so all right um, so, um, Maurice, if you can move down to the designer, the next case. Yeah, and I can preface this as Maurice goes down. So this is, uh, as requested by the planning commission members, uh, to come back before the commission to take one more look at how the connectivity between the Silver Hills project and the NRP project on Scranton Road Peninsula will address, uh, you know, the existing trails. And so it's really kind of a um, trail connectivity landscape plan presentation and Matt Moss will lead this discussion from our team. Well, just before I read them, will we be hearing both at the same time and then acting on each one individually? That is the better way to address this, mostly because it is one kind of master plan. So we'll do okay. two items and then address each. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So this is the Silver Hills project and uh, the Peninsula final project. So um, we'll hear them both and then we'll vote twice separately on this. The, the, so go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director. Again, this is Matt Moss with uh, on staff with the Planning Commission. So like the director said, I'll give an overview of the plan and the network improvements and connectivity changes that were made at the request of the commission. Uh, we'll present changes to the Silver Hills plan as well as changes to the NRP plan, and I'll turn it over to those respective teams when we get to those slides so they can comment specifically on the changes that we've made. And then I can wrap it up with some next steps and then answer any questions you all have. Next slide. So this is an overall aerial plan. This was prepared by our urban designer, Pega Norfard. I believe this was at the request of you, Madam Chair, in order to have a sense of all of these projects and where they fit together spatially. So these are the projects we've currently been looking at or, or have approved in, in recent history, including Silver Hills and NRP shown in the center. Next slide. So the goals here that, we, that we've taken another look at is to figure out what the multimodal connectivity will be to developments on the peninsula and to also close gaps between existing trails and connections. This slide here shows the existing trail network and then planned recommended trails, particularly as a part of the Irishtown Bend project. So you can see the Centennial Lakeling Trail, you can see the Towpath Trail, the connector over the Carter Road Bridge to what will, will be uh, the, the final connection for the Towpath. Uh, so what's shown here in, in, in this maroon and blue color are the connections that we've worked out with the Silver Hills and NRP team, as well as some future possible gaps that we still need to close. Next slide. So I, I did a site visit with one of my colleagues in MOCAP about two weeks ago. We actually met the Great Lakes team on site because part of the, the gap in this area would pass along their property. And so I wanted to take some uh, context photos for you all so you could see the conditions that are along Carter. This is the river side of Carter and, and this condition goes, uh, extends basically up to Silver Hills property. And it shows the guardrail, the edge of the road, and the sheet piling that exists along the road. So there is about pretty much from the edge of, of the road on the inland side of Carter, on the, sorry, on the river side of Carter, there's about a six foot drop down to grade. And there's basically this trench that runs along the side of the road. Next slide. This photo shows that condition. It does taper and sort of changes grade as it goes roughly northward, northeastward. And this shows uh, the challenges I think we're going to face in the future in closing these gaps and making that connection to the Lake Link Trail. You can see uh, on the other side uh, of, of Carter, there's a retaining wall present. And so these are some of the details we still need to work out. But this uh, analysis of the existing conditions ultimately is what informed our final recommendations. Next slide. So this is a comprehensive plan showing both Silver Hills site plan and, and NRP site plan. The site plan shown is, is the, the previous plans prior to changes that were made, but uh, we wanted to show this to show you the connection recommendations that, we, that we've made to both teams. So Silver Hills will present an updated site plan, which shows a multi-use path on the entirety of their frontage. Uh, but we did recommend a crossing roughly where a crossing had already been proposed to connect the two projects and have the connection also made as a 12 foot wide path 
on the NRP side south of that crossing because we still need uh, we need the flexibility in order to make the comfortable and appropriate and feasible connection to the Lake Link Trail. Next slide. So I'm going to hand it off to Brian Ullenbrock from from NEF. He is the civil engineer for Silver Hills, and he can walk through the details of the changes that they've made. I'm Brian Ullenbrock with NEF and Associates, uh, landscape architect here. Um, and uh, so Matt set this up pretty well, um, kind of explaining um, how we got to, to where we are today. Um, this is a site plan that um, everyone has seen um, prior to um, that, that we got some partial approval on. And we needed to come back and um, and revisit the streetscape and the sidewalk along the frontage, and that's the area in the in dashed in red um, that we'll be talking about today. Um, so, so the um, the main part that we're going to be talking about is the what's called out as the ten foot wide um, busy shared path section, and that goes from the right of the page on the north um, down to the entrance to the the drive entrance um, to the building to the south. Um, we, we know that this area, one of our concerns was just with all of the pedestrian traffic, um, the vehicular traffic coming in and out of the garage. Um, we wanted to make sure if this is a shared use path with, with bicycles um, that we are addressing it properly um, and making sure that the uh, vehicular pedestrian bicycle interactions um, were, were safe um, as, they, as they were passing through this zone. So some of the things that you're, you're going to see um, with the next slides are we added some curves. Um, we narrowed the path a little bit along this section to 10 feet as opposed to 12 feet. Um, and you'll see some uh, tread surfacing texture pattern differences in, in key key areas. Next slide. So on the uh, top of the page is the original design that we uh, presented um, last time we were here. And you can see it's more linear in nature, um, straight path. Uh, this was eight foot wide. Uh, to the right of the page, uh, the uh, kind of the darker hatched area was the main pedestrian entrance uh, to the building. And there are some um, benches that were pulled away from um, the entrance and the, the main sidewalk uh, went in front of that entrance. And what you see to the to the bottom of the page is our revised um, uh, sidewalk plan. And you'll see it's not as linear in, in nature. Um, there are some bends into the path. Um, you'll see some some banding. Uh, in there that is at the garage entrance. And you also see to the right that the sidewalk has been the, the 10 foot wide um, uh, shared path has been pulled away from the building um, in, in that location. Next slide. So um, this kind of gives a little bit more of, a, of a, an enlarged view of, um, of, of these areas. And we'll start from the south going north. So enlargement A is the, um, the 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 drive entrance to to the south buildings. Um, this is also the location that Matt mentioned where um, the shared path will, will be as of right now is proposed to cross the cross the street. You can see we've provided a, a gap for that to happen. There's an additional coordination that'll need to occur there um, as we kind of get get further into this. Um, but we we know that that needs to happen. Um, so we'll 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 address that when that time comes as as that further develops. Um, so heading north or to to the right of the page, um, you know, you'll see that the the sidewalk bends. Um, the prior design had the um, bulk of the landscaping at the street in this zone. Um, you'll see that we've taken that landscaping and put it up against the against the building that'll actually soften um, the the face of the building a little little bit in this area as well. Um, and we're in currently into some discussions on what with trees that we're going to be place, placing along the building. Um, we had upright columnar trees before. Um, we might do something even a little bit more narrow since it's it's against the building in, in, in this situation. So down at the bottom of the page for enlargement B, um, it's heading uh, north. So to the left, uh, that is where the um, vehicular garage entrance occurs. Um, so there is um, some banding on the sidewalk that will indicate to um, bicycle users that they, they need to pay attention that something's going on in, in this zone. Um, there's also striping on the pavement. Um, so as the uh, car is pulling out of the garage, they know that they need to be um, be careful as they're pulling out that there's a pedestrian crossing in, in that zone. Um, and then to to the right of the page, that is the, uh, the, the main entrance to the apartment buildings. Um, and, and you'll see that there 
we've actually maintained the eight foot that we had before, um, but we've also added an additional 10 feet um, for the shared path. And we pulled that shared path away from the entrance uh, to uh, reduce the amount of um, interaction between um, people that are passing by with, with bikes um, and, and the people coming in and out of the building. Benches have been put pushed up against the building and there's uh, planters that are added as well. Next slide. So th these are some cross sections um, that kind of give you a, a little bit of an idea of the spatial relationships. Um, so to the left is the original design. You can see the eight foot sidewalk that was originally up against the building um, and then the 13 foot tree lawn. And to the right of the page is the revised design. Um, you see that eight foot um, width has been maintained, but the sidewalk has been, been pushed out um, for the shared path um, to get it away from, from, from that entrance. And there's still a little bit of a, a green space in that zone. Um, there's a three foot wide planting bed um, and we'll have to put some some very salt tolerant hardy um, grasses um, and, and shrubs in that zone. That'll create just a little bit of a, of a um, buffer between the pedestrian and the vehicular uses. And that, that ends, I think that's all, all the slides that we have for, for this section of the, of the design. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Next slide, please. So to go back to the overall plan, uh, there were some additional changes also requested, I believe, by the commission for uh, two NRPs. So not just the addition or the, co the coordination with this path, but they had some, sh some changes that, that they would like to make as well. So I'll hand it off to Scott Skinner from NRP to go over those, those changes. Thank you very much, Matt. And, and thank you everybody for your time here today. So. Uh, on this slide, I'm, I'll be really brief because Matt spent a lot of time talking about the trail, but what you can see here is just another visual image of how the trail goes along down Carter Road, uh, along Silver Hill side of the street, and then crosses over to our side of the street. There's two more items that I wanted to point out um, on this drawing specifically. The, the green dashes you see are uh, just east of our site, or hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, the, the railroad that is on the east side of our site that can hopefully, again, become another walking tra trail increasing uh, connectivity. And then on the southern portion of our site, or the, to the left of this screen, uh, we're building a road that bisects our site and the Great Lakes land to the south. Uh, and the purpose of that is one access and two, if and when that railway goes away, it, it again creates a, an additional point of connectivity to the other side of the peninsula where the towpath is as well. Uh, so you can go to the next slide, please. So like Matt mentioned, we were really asked to look at three things last time we were here a few weeks ago. Um, the first is overall connectivity between our site and Silver Hills, and Matt covered that really well. Uh, the, the second is um, the, the winner for the plaza that bisects the two main buildings in our site is meant to be both an area that we can use first for parking, and then we can also close, close it off to use for programming. Um, since there's literally nowhere else to park on the peninsula, we're, we're not able to abandon it as parking entirely, but I believe it was Mr. Fluker asked that we basically switch the, the default there and, and look at it as pedestrian and programmable first with the option to use it as parking if necessary later. So what we can commit to here is to putting removable bollards, which you, you, you see on this image, at the entrance to this one earth. Um, and we can commit to keeping those up through lease up and then monitoring the parking utilization um, of our actual residents. Uh, so we can maintain the ability to remove them if and when we need, but it, we, we can commit to starting the development and starting lease up with those bollards in to make sure that the plaza be, uh, stays as a, as a primarily public pedestrian friendly space. And then third, we were asked to think creatively about how to more thoughtfully connect our plaza down to the Silver Hills Plaza across the street that, that leads down to the riverfront. So you, you saw in the image before that our, our, our two sort of plaza areas basically align, uh, but because of site constraints, they're just slightly off center. So I'll, I'll show you a closer image in a minute, just a minute, but the pink highlighted area at the bottom of the screen shows an angled staircase and, and a crosswalk that will hopefully guide both our residents and pedestrians more broadly down from our site to the Silver Hill site and, and into the river. Uh, next slide, please. So this just shows a, a vis visual image of what the public frontage on our site will look like and in, in the dimensions there as well. Uh, this is for the part of our site where the trail will actually go through, so the southern portion of our site. Uh, you see a 12 foot wide trail, some trees lining it, and then a, a walking path with a, a, a some terrace seating before some more trees. And then our building is just to the right of this image. Um, you know, we think this is a great scenario and we're, we're glad it worked out for two reasons. You know, one, it 
we're able to create real separate pathways that are meant for bikes and then pathways that are meant for pedestrians. Uh, then it also just serves as what we think will be a great amenity for our, our residents and the, and the greater public. Uh, and then you can go to the next slide, please. So this is an image of the staircase that, that, that I referenced that will connect ours in the Silver Hills uh, plazas. You can see that we've designed it to serve as both obviously a literal staircase because there's a significant topography drop down to the edge of our site, as well as a place where people can actually sit and, and congregate with lots of landscaping around and can look down at a crosswalk and, and, and down to the river eventually as well. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it back to Matt, who I think is gonna wrap up here, but I'm happy to answer any other questions that, that you all have afterwards. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, so just uh, to to summarize, we again have asked that both teams incorporate this path on either side because we're not sure yet where we can accommodate the connection on again either the river side of Carter or the inland side, just given the physical conditions that I showed earlier in the images. So we're going to work on that outcome with Great Lakes, and we have some. We're exploring, of course, gap funding for all our trail connections. We occasionally do run into situations where we have gaps to close and we have funding sources available that we can apply for. And so that's going to be an ongoing process. So next slide, please. So to summarize, we're gonna work with the remaining property owners. In this case, it's Great Lakes to de determine the feasibility of, of that connection and, and closing that gap to the Lakeling Trail. And we also need to figure out a solution for the gap between Silver Hills and Brewdog. That's along the Carter, Carter to the north, which would connect to the towpath trail there. And lastly, the, the third one that's not quite on here is, is we still don't have the final details on the exact location of the crosswalk, but we're going to work with our traffic engineering department to figure out exactly where that'll go and what that'll look like. And we'd be happy to bring that back to both the local design review committee and the commission, if you would like. So next slide, and I'll, we'll end with questions or comments. Okay. Commission members, first of all, thank you, Matt, and both applicants for spending the time, I think, working together on this. I think it was really useful and um, the projects are enhanced. So, so thank you all for, for this. Commission members, any questions? No, I, we have two uh, things to approve, right? So I'll move no. approval on. On the first one, okay, we'll read them. I do have one con one question though before we do that. Uh, I went out there and I looked at the site, and it really does look like the rail behind is not used at all. Like I was under the impression that maybe it's used infrequently, but when I went out there, it was completely in the upright position across the river. It looks to me that it's not used much at all. So just curious where that stands. Matt, do you know? It's something that, yes, Madam Chair, it's something that we've been aware of uh, and have had conversations with Flats Forward and the property owners down there. It's our understanding that Flats Industrial Railroad is no longer operating. Mm -hmm. So it's it's something we've been exploring and, and trying to guide and gather more information on to see if that land is available and and how what the future might be for that. But it's complicated. These rail spurs have history and they have uh, complicated details to them. So, Scott, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know pre pandemic it was being used about once a week. I think there was someone whose job it was was to literally go unlock the gate uh, so the train could go through uh, once a week. Um, to Matt's point, I, I, I've heard and seen anecdotally that it's uh, not being used at all anymore, but I, I, I can't speak uh, to that entirely. Okay. Lillian, as a uh, just former former life when I was an industrial site selector, um, you know, there's very often rail is an appealing you know thing for for business, but I think in this case, the grain silo over on the other peninsula is no longer using the rail and just practically uh, for a small uh, short line to just maintain the lift bridge. I, I think has to just Cost have an exorbitant cost, so I think it's pretty safe to assume that the rails, uh, e even if the grain silo came back up today, like at some point, it's going to determine does this does is this really Pence allowed to repair the lift bridge at some point in the future to maintain this limited rail service. So I see it as a great opportunity to create another path that could even maybe get you back up uh, to the red line greenway. Yeah. Directly. 
So. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Maurice, unfortunately, I need you to, to go back to the um, I, so, so I can read the the ordinance numbers or for both of these, if you don't mind. All right, so the first one is 2021-007. This is the Silver Hills Thunderbird uh, project. This is final landscape seeking final approval. Um, so can we have a motion for this first one? I Move think approval. I... Downing. McCray Scott, second. Uh, motion second. Uh, Michael, can you call the roll? Downing. Yes. Hurry. Yes. Gray Scott. Yes. Life. Yes. On uh, the second one is. Can you go to the second one, Maurice? Right below it. There you go. Is the next one, Maurice? Thank you. It's two zero one. It's this one, correct? It's the, the this is third. the third. This is the third one. This is the second one, and that's the first one. At least that's. I have three different screens. I don't know if they're. I think there's just two, correct, Michael? There's the Silver Hills, and then there's the NRP, right? Yeah, right. Oh, maybe. Oh, okay. Hills, they put a duplicate in there. Okay, okay. I see it. The peninsula, yes. Okay. The second one is uh, 2019-063. This is the Peninsula Final Landscape Plan seeking final approval. I move for approval. McCray I'll, Scott. I'll second. Downing. We have a motion second. Michael, can you call the roll? Downing. Yes. Hurry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. So I think we've done all of the cases and we can go back up to the. We do have one more, Madam Chair. We have one that is the Apollo. Okay. Um, and let's do that just to make sure we get which, it done. Which way are we going? Down. Going down past okay. this presentation to the Apollo. Okay. There we go. Uh, this is uh, 2021 018. This is the Apollo Apartments renovation seeking final approval. This is at 1250 Riverbed Street. Um, and uh, I'll need to swear you in. Ron, are you or anyone else speaking to this matter? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. Um, there's going to be myself. Uh, I have, we have Kevin Kelly um, who will be speaking on behalf of the project potentially. We also got Michael Lentz in attendance from Manic Smith, landscape architect. Okay. I'll uh, swear you all in. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer to the penalty of perjury? Yeah. I do. Okay. Um, and I was going to ask to the director, is uh, staff going to say anything first or should they go ahead? Oh, they should just go ahead. Okay. And if you could focus on the exterior, since this is a final approval, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, this is 1250 Riverbed Street. It is uh, in the flats area along Riverbed, uh, just adjacent to the Jacobs Nautica Pavilion and uh, to the powerhouse parking lot. It does abut the Superior Viaduct and sits along Heritage Park facing the Cuyahoga River. <clears throat> we are proposing a 70 unit apartment building. Um, the building itself has about 50,260 square feet currently. And the footprint of the uh, building is talking to me. Uh, the footprint of the building has 11,379 uh, square feet on the ground floor, which is 100% coverage of uh, the site itself. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, this is some context images of the current uh, building and site context. Uh, this shows the existing conditions. Uh, we intend to maintain the overall look and feel of the building and, and uh, feel that it speaks to the character of the Flats district. Um, the 
exception is on the ground floor. Uh, there's a lot of infill that has occurred over the years um, and uh, loading dock doors and things like that, that we will be replacing with windows um, and uh, opening up this elevation to uh, allow for residential use on the ground floor. On the rear of the building, uh, next slide, please. You can see that there are less windows if you look at the upper slides. <clears throat> so we do are presenting uh, additional punched windows up over there as well. Uh, these top few, or these bottom few uh, images are looking at the view uh, from the viaduct, uh, looking around uh, both at the building and, and around at the context um, in the, that area. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the historic images that we were able to find from the historic registries. Um, and looking at the uh, viaduct as well as the building, uh, if you look at the middle image on the right, you can see the building there um, already existing. Uh, this is a 1978 photo, but it, it was existing in the, even the 1910s and 20s. Next slide, please. This is the ground floor, and our client has also uh, has a ground lease that they're executing under the viaduct. Um, so what we're intending to do is actually, since we're fully built out to the extents of the um, site, uh, we are intending to provide an amenity landscaped area under the viaduct um, and really taking advantage of one of these unique features that are that are very unique to the area and, and we feel that um, would benefit greatly from the enhancement and that would benefit to the, uh, the uh, people that live in the apartments. Um, it will be fenced uh, along the parking lot side on the left of, of this image. Um, where it's facing the Nautica Pavilion lot and the powerhouse lot. Um, so this would be a, a fenced area with a lot of greenery and um, areas. We have some renderings later on in the, in the slides. Next slide, please. Now, this is the ground floor. Um, looking at the way that uh, both the entry is organized on the right, which I'll have a blow up slide of so you guys can get a better sense of the actual entry sequence and how it relates to the outside as well as the, the unit layout. Um, facing the street as well as facing the viaduct. The viaduct would be at the top of the page and, and Riverbed Street would be at the bottom of the page in this. Uh, next slide, please. This is a uh, typical upper floor. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the, the fifth floor um, where the, the two building shapes uh, sort of change. Uh, so we do have an amenity deck here, and this would be an exterior deck that you see sort of on that left half of, of the drawing. Uh, that you see a staircase at the top of the page that would exit up to the viaduct. That would be an emergency egress exit um, that would be uh, locked to keep uh, non-residents from uh, getting down and in. But it is visible from the viaduct itself. And uh, it does have a presence to it, so we do have a rendering to show that as well. Uh, next slide, please. This is the top floor, which does um, access the viaduct through an existing bridge that that is already there. And uh, these would be offices um, for the landlord and and for the that company, and basically provide office space that um, has a view out. Um, as you can see, the viaduct sort of ends at the second vertical grid line um, from the right. Uh, just by that bridge. And so there's a whole swath of windows and views that are just past the viaduct looking out uh, towards the flats area and, and towards um, the powerhouse area. Next slide, please. This is a blow up of the ground floor, just uh, giving you a sense of the context um, of the entry. We did recess the entry a little bit um, since the uh, building abuts the ed edge of the uh, site and abuts the sidewalk. We thought that having a recessed entry along that sidewalk would be advantageous to sort of pull um, people back a little bit from the sidewalk as they're waiting to be allowed in if they're guests or um, you know, to allow for that um, as a better experience. We've also punched a few windows on the right of the image. Uh, some of these were infill, some of these were smaller windows that, that were increasing, but this is a view out towards uh, the street and the Nautica Pavilion to the right. Next slide, please. If this is the existing conditions. You can see that um, the dashed lines on the ground floor are showing the demolition of a lot of the um, existing uh, ground floor elements, and uh, we'll look at the renderings to see what's proposed. Next slide, please. This is the rear showing uh, 
all of the uh, penetrations that we will be providing for the residences. Next slide, please. This is on the lower left, you can see a few penetrations that we're providing for uh, that ground floor lobby that we had looked at. Next slide, please. I think it would be better to advance to the rendered elevations. I think uh, these are all the technical elevations for the call outs to show uh, any, to answer any questions, but I think based on the time, I think it would be probably better to look at the rendered elevations. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the riverbed street elevation. Um, there are uh, an existing series of balconies made out of uh, metalwork uh, that were built over the course of the past few decades um, by artisans who lived in these lofts. Um, they are not in any way verifiably code compliant. And what we're proposing is to take these down, but we do want to keep them. So we will be addressing them as applique on, along the facade. Um, and we're going to be dancing them sort of across the facade to provide some interest to the building. Uh, you can see the uh, entry canopy on the lower right, um, as well as a blade sign that you can see going up the building that we reviewed in, in schematic approval as well. Uh, one of the comments we received was some of the fenestration along the glazing that we've updated and received approval from DRC. Uh, we want to provide as much openness as possible um, on that street, um, but do want to respect the privacy of the fact that these are residential bedrooms. Um, or kitchens, and so we are um, frosting half of it, which you can see in lighter, and then providing view glass on the left half. Next slide, please. This is the rear uh, view facing the viaduct. Uh, we've ghosted the viaduct for uh, an understanding of context. You can see uh, the way that the uh, viaduct relates to the building, the way that it sort of terminates a little bit short of those offices that are on the upper left. Um, looking out, um, but it does connect in time to provide access at that entry point to the offices at the top. Um, and uh, at the bottom under the viaduct, you can see the residential entrance um, where residents would enter through the viaduct um, green area and into, into the lobby spaces. Um, I think that would be more of a primary residential entrance since they'll be parking uh, at the Nautica Pavilion lots where our owners secured uh, long term parking. Next slide, please. This, I think, gives you a good sense of the blade sign on the left um, and uh, a sense of the relationship of the existing townhomes on the right that are grayed out in terms of context. Next slide, please. This is some technical information on the blade sign. I, I think that it's um, appropriately scaled. We reviewed this in the schematic review and, and uh, I think we all came to agreement on it, but this is some additional information. It is a backlit sign. Um, that will provide a, a good view of that signage even in the evening hours, as well as emanate some light. Next slide, please. This gives you a good sense of the scale of the sign in context. The scale of the sign looked a bit large in those images relative to the building. But you can see the scale of the, the community here is, is pretty grand with the jackknife bridge, um, the viaduct. And so this is the sign in that background that you can see in terms of context. Next slide, please. This is a rendering of the viaduct underneath um, and showing the landscaped intentions of the, the space uh, for the residents. Uh, you can see that it's gr green space with some pockets of um, areas for them to hang out uh, and do various activities. We have some uh, Tivoli lighting on poles, but those poles would also be powered so that people could pull up chairs and, and plug in laptops and, and work out there. Uh, fire pit areas, uh, some sculpture space and some uh, sort of edge seating. Uh, next slide, please. This is another view in the evening of that same space uh, with some up lighting to add uh, effect to the um, viaduct itself and enhance that uh, view of the space and address it in that way. Next slide, please. This is the rooftop deck. This is the rooftop amenity deck. Um, so I, I would like to note that this is viewable from the viaduct. Um, so uh, the public that would be on the viaduct would have a view of this. So we took the space uh, seriously, in terms of providing it programmatically, as well as uh, addressing it as um, a highly visible potential space and um, also using it to frame the views of the city for the tenants. This is their sort of private outdoor lounge that actually has those city views and, and provides the look down. If you imagine standing on the edge there, looking down on the river, 
um, and looking out towards the bridges, this is the, the moment that they'll all have uh, to have that opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. These are some of the interior views. I think based on uh, council's comment, uh, we'll skip through these quickly unless anybody has any questions. Next slide, please. Interior office views. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the overall civil drawing showing the, the context of the space. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll hand it over to Manik and Smith um, to describe the landscape a little bit as well. Thank you, Ron. Uh, the landscape plan is shown. You see the building on the bottom of the page and the parking lots to the top of the page. We have a path running through to a gate, uh, through the gated uh, area to the north at the parking lot. And we created a space with shrubbery and plantings along the fence to kind of close off the parking lot from view created a space under here. The green that you saw in the rendering is a synthetic turf to reduce the need for irrigation across this whole area. There will be some irrigation needed to keep the plants in the area along the fence, but we will plant those with uh, drought tolerant and salt tolerant plantings. That's all I have. Slide. I think that's that's, that's it. Really okay. Um, there was one comment on the design review about the adjacent to the bridge. I don't know if you saw that. Um, I saw on the the list, but I think you've addressed it. Is that correct? Uh, we have addressed it. It is an existing connection. Okay. Um, and so uh, we intend to maintain that existing connection. We're not. Uh, providing a new connection to the viaduct. Um, but with that, we do intend uh, to have a presentation to the Landmarks Commission uh, to make sure that uh, they see this and understand it as well. Okay, good. So, um, I, this is for final approval um, uh, to the commission members who makes the motion. The request from design review was, I don't know if it's a request or it's actually technically a requirement, but that that since this is a historic structure that that you present also to the Landmarks Commission. Um, and so if that could be included in the motion, um, that would be great. But uh, I think and it's an note, excellent. Yeah. You, uh, I believe that the comment was with regards to the viaduct and the viaduct bridge. The building itself is in a historic yes. district, but it's not a historic building. Yeah. I okay. meant the viaduct, sorry. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, I'll move approval with the stipulation that a presentation be made to the Landmarks Commission uh, regarding the viaduct. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. McCray and Scott. A second. Um, any further comment? I will say it's a wonderful project and um, really I, I think the attention to detail that you guys have in the public space and it's going to be a great project. So thank you. Very so director Long, I agree, and uh, you have very strong support from Flats Forward, who sent a comment earlier this week. So great work. And and I might also point out, uh, Madam Chair, that this uh, received their zoning variances a couple of weeks ago. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, well, we'll call the roll. Downing. Yes. Murray. Yes. McRae Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Looking forward to seeing this one. Open. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, to the director, if it's okay, I think the la there are two items left. One is to vote in a, a new member of design review. I wonder if we could do that quickly, just so Diane will still be here, and then we'll go to the flats. So if this could be pretty quick. Absolutely. Uh, I'll turn it over to Kim Scott, the city planner for Euclid Corridor. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and um, Commission members. Uh, the I believe that you all have the um, the resume of Andrew Sargent, who uh, happens to be uh, an Enterprise uh, Rose Architectural Fellow with Neighborhood Progress, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. Currently, um, he comes to me with uh, high high recommendations 
uh, and I've had a, a brief orientation with him. And so um, I would recommend that he become a uh, committee member of the Euclid Corridor Design Review Committee. Thank you. Okay. I move approval down in. I second McCray Scott. Uh, let's call the roll, Michael. Downing. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Um, great. Back to the um, design and guidelines for the flats and a question first to the director, just so procedurally, are we, um, uh, will we be um, adopting these design guidelines today? Yes, that's correct. We are requesting an adoption from the planning commission so that staff may utilize the guidelines as recommendations okay. um, or uh, yeah, guidelines to uh, developers. Okay, so or I have a local design review. Okay, quick question. I think there are two options. One is to present them quickly before uh, commission member Downing has to leave. So that would give you about 15 minutes um, and then we could vote. Or we postpone this, or we go ahead and hear it, but we don't vote it until later. So, um, I would say if it's possible to do this in 15 minutes, I would go ahead and do that. Yes, let's move ahead. Uh, the presenters were able to present in 10 to 12 minutes yesterday design review. So I would encourage you to move at that same pace. And my, my comments before they start is that this is the design guidelines, uh, which are recommendation of the vision for the Valley plan, which were adopted last fall. And so these are going to be really critical as uh, we seek to have a more consistent look along the riverfront. Um, and, you know, the larger strategy around riverfront is top of mind for us. And this is one of the steps to get us to that place. So with, without further ado, Joel, if you could move ahead um, and if you could start also by clarifying um, which geographies um, these are aiming to, to um, be applied to. Thanks. Also, anybody who's going to speak besides Joel, including Joel, I'll need to swear you in. Is, is there anyone else here to speak to this? Yes, uh, Arthur. Okay. Do you, yeah. Okay. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer to the penalty of perjury? I do. Okay. Take it away. Okay. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commission members, Director Wang. I'm Joel Ambiscus from Lance Studio. I'll give a quick introduction before I hand it over to the consultant team of OHM and Merrick Chase. Uh, as Director Wang pointed out, uh, this you know specifically comes from uh, a recommendation made by uh, in the Vision for the Valley Plan, but more specifically, about a year ago, uh, the City, Canalway Partners, Metro Parks began planning work on the separate projects that were all adjacent to each other. Uh, Heritage Park, a portion of Canal Basin Park, which both, of course, are next to Settlers Landing. So while these are three separate parks, most of the, most people see this as a single park. So that really pushed more immediately the needs to put together guidelines. And so at that point, um, MOCAP, City Planning, Metro Parks, that's Ford and Canal Partners, um, you know, worked the plan. We facilitated a process uh, and then I'll, you know, essentially Arthur's, Arthur and Matt are going to go over them. So I'll, I'll hand it over to them uh, and we'll, we'll be quick. Sounds good. Thank you, Joel. If yeah. uh, you can advance to the next slide, we also have um, Gina Chase um, and Alex Kelly uh, from Mayor Chase who uh, were on our team uh, as well. So very quickly, I just want to give you an overview of the project process. Um, this just kind of summarizes um, uh, what we were doing. It was streamlined, um, as Joel mentioned, due to the impending projects uh, that were happening in the study area. Uh, but it was also a very collaborative process between uh, the consultant team and the project team as well. We did a couple of site walks, uh, a couple of different design charrettes uh, and workshops before ultimately coming together for uh, these design guidelines that you have before you. If you go to the next slide, this um, begins to show you the context in which we were working in. Um, as we know, the Cuyahoga River is one of our region's primary natural and economic resources. And as Joel was pointing out and others over the past decade, we've had a mix of trails, parks, water recreation, um, an adjacent development that has um, increased uh, with a, a, along with a flurry of studies and development in the area as well. And then on the next slide, we kind of zone in on our project study area specifically for this project. Um, so while we have a variety of riverfront spaces uh, and various development at various stages, as we've seen today during uh, the earlier presentations, we really want to make sure that the community uh, is connected uh, to the green space and connected to the riverfront. So these near-term projects that we're showing here, Irish Town Bend, 
Heritage Park 1 and 2, Canal Basin Park, and Settlers Landing really established the primary focus for these design guidelines, but we have been developing these uh, with the intent to uh, implement them throughout the Kiowa River Valley. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows uh, some of the existing conditions uh, that we took during our site walk. And if you go uh, to two slides here, uh, Maurice, if you're controlling for us, um, these images uh, begin to show kind of the lack of continuous uh, public access to our river's edge. Uh, in the one, you see Mormon's Wharf, which has it. Uh, on the right, you see uh, the Graincraft property, which currently doesn't have that. And this is just kind of uh, an example of, of the two different conditions we've seen down here. And then if you go to the next slide, these images begin to show what are the existing conditions down there and this sort of eclectic mix that we have in terms of materials, uh, furniture, lighting types, uh, paving, uh, and even vegetation. Uh, so we began to take all this information, and if you go to the next slide, uh, start to understand what is uh, the character uh, of this area, of these design guidelines. So this process started to under with an understanding of the existing conditions, and we progressed into an exploration of that future character for the class. There were three character themes that popped out, riverine, industrial, and civic, as you see on the screen there. And we started to introduce the pros and cons uh, and discuss them as a group. Uh, these themes were included with various uh, future uh, material palettes, uh, riverfront aesthetics, sustainability, and longevity. And if you go to the next slide, ultimately what came about this was this combination of industrial and civic themes uh, emerging as the preferred theme, uh, which we are coining here civic industrial. So, the combination of the civic and industrial character themes begin to build on the industrial legacy of the flats, while also introducing a consistent civic scale and detail um, and, and a bit of refinement to the riverfront. So without being a little too, too gritty, too bulky, uh, or even too sterile, this civic industrial theme begins to emphasize the working riverfront heritage with steel, wood, and stone materials, as you'll see, uh, and beginning to refine that in how we select benches, lightings, railings, and other design element materials. So even if they're not mentioned in here, any elements that are not, are not specifically recommended in these design guidelines, we are uh, showing to meet this civic industrial character. And then if we go into the next slide, uh, Matt Hills is gonna start talking about uh, the water zones and how we began to uh, organize uh, this uh, section. Two more slides, please. Good morning, everyone, I'm Matt Hills. Thank you. One of the primary goals of these guidelines is to create a certain level of consistency along the river's edge while still allowing each individual site's uniqueness to shine through. And so how does one balance consistency with this unique expression? The solution that we arrived at was what's shown in this diagram here, which was to break down the riverfront zone into three smaller zones. Uh, starting from the left, if you could go to the next slide, please. You can see the gathering zone, which is the farthest from the river and encompasses the most flexible area. You will see across the bottom there, the flexible and the arrow connecting flexible to fixed on the right. This demonstrates how we are assigning these guidelines uh, less rigidly in the gathering zone all the way through to most rigidly at the water zone. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of current gathering zones along the river within the study area. I'm sure these are all readily recognizable to you. Next slide. The next is the access zone, which is right along the river. And if you go to the next slide, you can see uh, some examples of that. It's typically the area where there is existing public access immediately behind the bulkhead or where there could be in the future. Next. Lastly is the water zone, which is at the bulkhead and directly in front of it. This is typically where water access will happen or does happen. And we also look at railing applications in this area. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of that condition in today's conditions. Next slide, please. Now, Nina Chase will take over from Merritt Chase and she will talk about the elements themselves. Can I ask a quick question? If you go back, I'm sorry, I'm not going to hold things up, but if you go back to the section, um, just curious, um, yeah, that, that section um, is that um, uh, it, the design guidelines are saying that the, the boardwalk technically overhangs the water zone. And I'm just curious 
like that's obviously a, a more expensive and uh, kind of difficult some places where there are is still you know industrial use of the river, and it also for me worries me that it lets some people off the hook down the line when we need to have the access zone be required legislatively. So I can think of one instance on the east bank of the flats where that happened, where the building uh, owner refused to, to leave public access along their outdoor seating and said later somebody else will overhang something and pay for it. So I do worry about this section. Um, it worries me for many reasons. Um, we do need to legislate that some access zone is required of everybody along the flats and that by putting the boardwalk always in the river zone that will let some people off the hook until we legislate it yes i'll briefly uh, address that question madam chair and then hand it to nina as well these this section demonstrates the current conditions for today uh, there are six sections if you go to the next slide where the existing boardwalk uh, is overhanging the water and that edge and so that is there is a gray zone in here but nina has worked on other riverfront similar projects and can speak to this topic some more yeah thank you matt um and thank you madam chair we um i think one of the points maybe to to your question that would be important is that the access zone does have pedestrian access and a and a set trail width that would be um, recommended as part of the access zone when there is that space on land. Um, and so if you weren't to have the, the extra space for a boardwalk, you still would be, the guidelines are recommending um, uh, access and pedestrian access and bike access through a property so that you maintain connectivity for the whole network. Um, if that answer, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but the boardwalk is kind of an additional piece um, or be recommended when the space allows from a working waterfront perspective, but also from a um, infrastructure perspective. Excuse me, Madam Chair, you're muted. I, I wondered if there should be two conditions. Mm -hmm. So there's a condition when that existing state is there, but there's also a section that would should be required of people when there will there is not able to be a boardwalk hung right. because then we'll it will I, I guess where I'm going is we want to have a continuous boardwalk. We'll have a shifting of to sort of pedestrian walk and some places where there's a little bit of boardwalk. Mm -hmm. So I think down the line the whole point is to have a continuous riverfront where some of this will connect to each other. So I actually wonder if there's two sections that people have to figure out what meets their their the requirements of their particular site along the length, uh, but with this intention that there's always a condition where you might have some boardwalk and some walk. Does that make sense? Yes, I think this best solution is for us to take the boardwalk off of the um, River zone, if we can go back one slide, the water zone, and we just show access down to the water in that area. Uh, in two slides ago, the access zone covers uh, boardwalk and trail conditions. So we can make those modifications and address your comment. Okay. So then could you forward to the slide that says elements? Go back one blue slide that says elements. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to the elements component. So Matt talked about the zones, which sets up kind of the framework and the skeleton for how we're thinking about with the ways in which the different zones along the riverfront work. Um, and the elements in particular span across all of those three zones. And the elements are the specific site furniture and specific recommendations um, for design, ele design elements. Um, so uh, I'll give a brief overview of seating, bike parking and repair stations, litter receptacles and dogway stations, lighting, paving, railings, boardwalk and water access, vegetation signage and public art. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we see seating and this gives you a good example of how we've structured this document for all of the elements. We have um, uh, recommended, recommended um, elements that you can see uh, and a variety of options. Um, and then a series of elements that have been um, 
recommended as, as aesthetics and, and elements to avoid. So those are the ones with the X's through them. Um, so for seating, we have recommended benches, a couple of different types and, um, uh, and different ways in which seating can be integrated. Um, we also have group seating uh, and all of the furniture is selected to be able to kind of um, be a single element or group together as needed, depending on the application in a different zone. Um, next slide. Uh, bike parking and repair stations, looking at a standard bike rack, uh, U bike rack, and then also a standard bike repair station. And for each of these, we have multiple options to select from. Next slide. Um, litter receptacles and dog waste stations. And for all of these in the document itself, we have recommendations for color and material. And so there's a consistency, even if a different brand is selected, ultimately the colors and the consistency of, of general look and feel to meet that civic industrial character is being met. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, lighting, developing a standard that would uh, kind of march down down the waterfront edge. Um, we have options for pedestrian scaled poles and also for bollards um, that are smaller in scale for more of the gathering areas. Next slide. Some additional recommendations and then um, for lighting elements to avoid such as vehicularly scaled poles and non-shielded dark sky non-compliant fixtures. Next slide. Um, for paving, again, to create that consistency uh, across the waterfront of recommendations related to asphalt, concrete, and different types of pavers that would be appropriate, and then a series of uh, elements uh, and paving types that we would recommend avoiding. Next slide. Um, similarly, with boardwalk and water access, uh, many of these elements would need to be um, custom and site specific, but we are making recommendations related to um, wood selection and avoiding engineered products. Next slide. Um, for railings, taking some cues from existing railings that are that are working really well along the, the waterfront um, and recommending additional uh, options that integrate stainless steel or galvanized steel with wood um, and then elements um, such as pipe railings and more residential scaled and aesthetic looking fencing that um, we would be avoiding. Next slide. Um, vegetation as well, uh, trying to uh, include a consistent palette that is, is flexible for the site, depending on what the needs are of each of the, of the locations, but recommending native non-invasive perennial riverine vegetation um, and avoiding water intensive annuals um, and, and planting strategies that require uh, intensive maintenance. Next slide. Signage, we're taking cues from a number of the signage standards and um, wayfinding programs that have been established for this area and others. Um, and so referencing existing signage standards and not recommending a, a new slate of signage, but building off of what's been done today and leverage the existing work. Next slide. And then recommendations at a high level for public art, public art that celebrates and reinterprets the industrial artifacts, um, public art that encourages participation and takes up space and allows people to be within and underneath the art. And then also uh, in the public art category, thinking about programming and events as public art experiences. Next slide. Um, oh, go I ahead. can jump on this one, Nina. Yep. And then we just developed a quick uh, design guideline checklist uh, for staff um, and design review and planning commission uh, to be used with um, pro the project partners and with uh, private developers just to help um, organize and understand which elements uh, would be uh, within which zones um, and just something of, again, a checklist uh, to be reviewed as applications and development projects come forward. I believe that's it. And to address your comment here, Madam Chair, we would move the word boardwalk from the water zone to the access zone, exit zone so that we can make that clear that there is not to be boardwalk within the water zone. Okay. Madam Chair, this is Director Huang. I wanted to just emphasize that uh, the motion should be to request um, staff to be able to implement this through the design review process for flats downtown. And a note of clarification that the documentation that is in the hands of 
the city staff should be the one that includes the design guidelines checklist, but not any specific vendors. Thanks. Okay. Commission members, any other comments or questions? Yeah, I'll move approval incorporating the director's comments. I'll second. Um, okay. Uh, motion and a second. Um, uh, Michael, can you call the roll? Downing. Yes. Hurry. Yes. Craig Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Um, I think the meeting's adjourned. Um, thank you to commission members, but um, I'm going to ask the director if she has any uh, final comments or a director's report today. Um, yes, thank you all for uh, reviewing this design checklist and we're really excited about what's happening in the flats and you've seen so many projects already. So just wanna emphasize thank you for that. Um, I do wanna note that on the staff side, we um, uh, are losing a staff member. And so if Shannon Leonard uh, would be uh, willing to unmute herself and share a little bit more about her next steps and, and plans, that would be great. Thank you, um, Director Hong. Uh, so it's very bittersweet to announce um, that I will be leaving the city of Cleveland. I'm originally from North Carolina. Um, I moved here eight years ago to go to grad school at Cleveland State and get my master's in urban planning. Um, I landed a job here, have worked here. Um, I got married. I recently had an uh, infant son back in June. Um, he's now nine months old. Um, and so my parents and my sisters all still live in North Carolina, and I was given an opportunity uh, recently. I had several opportunities to choose from, uh, but an opportunity to allow me to uh, move uh, back home with my uh, parents that are getting older, uh, as well as my sisters uh, to raise our son. Um, it's so hard because I, I have thoroughly enjoyed all of the connections and relationships I've built here um, and the work that I do. Um, I didn't know a lot about zoning when I started fresh with my masters uh, back five years ago, um, but I learned so much. I set out to try to make it as um, easily understandable and teachable as possible because zoning in our city is such a, it can be such an in the weeds kind of work. Um, and so I tried to, you know, whether it be everyday uh, citizens to the developers that I worked with to make it really easily understandable, uh, teachable and fair across the board, as well as to help those with some of the fewest of resources uh, to better their lives. Um, and so that was always my mission. Uh, and so I continue that. I learned so much from that. Um, from you all, you challenged me on a regular basis. Um, and I just really thoroughly enjoyed the work and I'm really going to miss it. Um, there's really no words that could um, put into uh, words to express my gratitude. I'm humbled uh, by the opportunities that I've been presented and the people that I've met. Uh, and I'm nervous and excited about my next opportunity. I will miss all of you. I will be here uh, working remote probably through the summer. Um, and so if you need anything, feel free to reach out. I'll be sending a follow-up email with um, my non-work email, so to speak. Um, and so I just wanna thank you all. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Thank you, Director. And thank you to all of my colleagues. Um, I will definitely miss you guys. And I hope that whoever comes behind me uh, can remember to just treat everybody fairly uh, across the board. Um, and try to use zoning in a way that uplifts rather than uh, puts down it has been used in uh, history. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon, you have been impressive and so excellent to work with. And um, just really, really, I've been so impressed with you and um, you've taken on some of the most complicated matters. And as you said, you treated people fairly and you really helped us think through things. And so you really will be missed. But I'm happy for you. Um, but keep in touch and you can come back. You know. <laughs> I, I tell Shannon, the offer always stands. If you want to come back to the city of Cleveland, you know, 
we'll, we'll have a space for you. Um, so it's, it's just with great sadness, um, everything Shannon has shared, I 100, 200,000 percent agree. She is just a woman of character and, um, and really an expert, and she's used her expertise equitably and fairly. So um, we will really miss your public service here. But as a mother myself, I understand um, how, how challenging it is to be um, and how, how great it will be to be closer to support. So on behalf of the planning staff and um, everyone that you have served will miss you. Thank you. Tough shoes to fill. I don't know how you're going to fill Tough those shoes. shoes. <laughs> yes, and on that note, we are hiring. So all you zoning, zoning experts, people who are excited about form based code, we have openings because again, big shoes to fill. We also have posted the assistant director role. Um, that is closing tonight. So anyone who is interested in applying for that, there are a few hours left and uh, we are hiring. So um, we, you know, we're still looking for an architect to take on downtown and flats design review, as well as really think through how we can accomplish this vision for the Valley. So um, just putting the call out there for folks to join our team to serve the public, to serve the city and to make a lasting imprint like Shannon and others. So thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? And Shannon, I, I have no doubt you're going to do amazing, more amazing things and continue to have an impact. So congratulations, but you really will be missed. It's a big, big, big problem for uh, all of us. <laughs> so thank no. you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Right. Um, anyone else? I think that's it. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.